So that is what I have kind of tried. Uh, just to make the stock complete, I have added a few basics as well, which I think uh, it must have already have been covered in the course, but I have, you know, uh, put that already. So um, uh, if, if uh, for those topics, we can go a little fast, but um, uh, uh, since again, I'm not under any pressure, so I can stop and anywhere and, you know, discuss any topic uh, uh, as we go along. So just feel free to stop me anywhere and then, um, you know, whatever, uh, uh, you know, it needs to be discussed. We can discuss that in detail and few things we can just go over quickly. Um, again, few things I've added just because uh, for the completeness, I know Rajat must have covered that in the course, but uh, just for the completeness, I've kind of added that. Yeah, feel free to ask questions. I think, yes. you know, keep stopping and okay. ask him, trouble him as much as possible. This that is, is that, yeah, yeah, that is precisely the point, yes. Yes, and again, uh, it, it need not be just this lecture, even after this, if anybody's interested, they are definitely more than welcome uh, to kind of write an email, check our website, you know, and, and then, um, uh, you know, uh, that day. Okay, so uh, the way I have planned is, uh, uh, I'll just start with, again, some, some basics uh, of, of uh, entangled photons, and then, one, one physical process by which the entangled photons can be produced or are produced rather. Uh, there, there, there are uh, several physical processes, but one at least in optics that is most widely used that I will discuss in, in kind of details with, with, with some basic physics as well. And then the experiments that have been done uh, to, to kind of explore the fundamental aspects with the, with the entangled photons produced by that process, which we call parametric down conversion. And again, some physical experiments then I will discuss, which are part of like applications, uh, either upcoming applications or, uh, you know, the proof of principle type application that have been uh, demonstrated so far. Okay, so uh, with that, let me just um, get started. I like this, uh, yeah, so I like my slide. <laughs> this is, although this is wrong, but this is uh, uh, kind of gives the idea as to what entanglement is. So if two particles are entangled, if we disturb one, uh, both of them get uh, disturbed. This is a very, very simplistic uh, view of uh, how entanglement is, but this conveys the idea also to a very good extent. And this is precisely the idea uh, that uh, EPR, Einstein, Podolsky, Rose, and this is a 1935 paper, which is still discussed. Uh, they, they interpreted entanglement to actually mean this. But of course, this is, as I said, this is not the, uh, the exactly correct picture, but it conveys the idea to a very good extent. Uh, and and just, because, just because entanglement has this kind of interpretation, uh, EPR kind of objected uh, to, to, to you know, uh, this kind of phenomenon that, yeah, physically such things cannot happen and they had their own arguments. And then they suggested that maybe there can be an alternative theory, which will have some more variables, they said hidden variables. And if we use that theory, maybe we do not need in uh, quantum theory and maybe entanglement within the new theory can be explained without using the uh, wave function. So that was the uh, kind of idea. So uh, let me just go now, uh, we'll do a little more uh, uh, rigorous and serious math, not just cartoon. So I, I here I will just try to capture what was um, EPR's einstein podolsky rosens way of looking at entanglement and why they thought that that's a problematic uh, uh, interpretation of phenomenon kind of coming out of uh, the, 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 the very concept of entanglement, at least, with, at least within the quantum theory. Okay, so even within the quantum theory, let's say we have a one particle uh, state, and this, I'm just, I have just considered just one of the state, and this is the state, one photon state or one particle state where it's diffracting uh, you know, from, from, from one point. So it's like light diffracting uh, from a single slit or, or a hole or something that people have must have studied in, uh, in some optics course. Uh, so for this, such a wave function, for, for, for such a uh, state of a particle, the, we say that the position is fixed because we know that the particle, at least at this point, uh, the, the X location of particle was this X naught. But what about the momentum of the particle? Well, if it is, at least at this point, at this uh, point, since the position is fixed, the light coming out of this or a single photon coming out of this can go in any direction. And hence the momentum is completely uncertain. So for this field or this state, quantum state, we'll say that the uncertainty in position is zero 
and the uncertainty in momentum is infinity. Uh, now let's take another state. And here we have this plane wave. Uh, plane wave, this is also a state of a particle. But in this case, the momentum is fixed because it is going in some uh, one direction. So for this state, which we also call plane wave, uh, for this state for which the momentum is fixed, the, uh, just give me one second. So uh, Anand, when you say wave, yeah. we should think of it as a quantum state, some kind of a quantum state. Is that? Uh... Yes. So, uh, so like wave mechanics, I mean, the, the uh, wave mechanics, and when we say the wave particle, uh, uh, wave part of a quantum particle, these two are pretty much the same thing. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, quantum mechanics is not just wave mechanics, but in quantum mechanics, we have a, a particle aspect and wave aspect. So when we are discussing the wave aspect only, at that point, the uh, wave mechanics and quantum mechanics are pretty much the same. But, but the quantum mechanics has this wave particle duality aspect that makes it exclusively quantum. So mm -hmm. just when discussing just the wave aspect, then yes, it is pretty much the same. I can call it a plane wave or I can call it a state of a single particle, uh, both works. So, I mean, uh, or I mean, in, in, in the classical uh, optics, when we say plane wave, I mean, we imagine, we imagine a light field uh, where you, you have kind of light everywhere. I mean, if you put a detector, you detect something, put a detector here, I mean, you, you detect some light everywhere. But when we say the same thing about the state of a particle, and now then you come in with a detector, then you won't find that the light is, uh, you, you won't find detector going click here, here, here. No, det detector will only click at a particular location because one, the moment you measure a single uh, a photon, mm -hmm. you, you, you get the entire thing at one point. So when it comes to measurement, a single photon field will behave like a particle, but when it's propagating, when it's moving, it just behaves like a wave, which is the wave function representation that we do. Thanks. Uh, so, so if if I have a state of a particle, uh, so, hi, in, sir. Uh, yes, I have yeah, a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question. So, um, so far we learned that uh, we can describe a quantum state of a particle using as a unit vector in a Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. So, in, uh, does this wave picture and this in both of these things tied up somehow? Yes. So, uh, I mean, uh, when you say a vector. For example, okay, so what I'm discussing here is a position and momentum. So these are also a basis, but these are what's called the infinite dimensional basis. Each point, each point is a vector in the Hilbert space. And of course, it's an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. So for example, position, uh, that is a basis, an infinite dimensional basis. Momentum is an infinite dimensional basis. Uh, so, and, and you can also have a, even for light, you can also have a finite dimensional basis, for example, polarization, that's just a two dimensional basis. So then it's just a, a matter of, you know, uh, whether finite or infinite. And again, in this talk, uh, we'll be discussing both. I mean, I will discuss polarization. In fact, there is another uh, basis, which is called orbital angular momentum, which is infinite dimension, but not continuous. It is actually discrete. Uh, so yeah, th th there are several bases that, that you can actually work with. And depending on what application one has in mind, you know, you could use one uh, entanglement or correlation in one basis or in some other basis. Yes. Yeah, so so I guess the main difference here is that we, we did not concern ourselves with continuous or infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, but I guess you will have to if you go to physics. So Anand will talk about infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. Okay. okay. Yeah, so I, 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 I just I, wanted to know that man, the, the det detection thing that you mentioned, that uh, when we place a detector, it will just click at one point. Mm -hmm. That means we are making a measurement, right? So. Um, this should be the this should be same as taking a projection, right? So that that is what I was. Yeah, typically, when we talk about measurement, it is always the projective measurement that one talks about. Yes. So so when you do the measurement, yes. Uh, I mean, the measurement is done by some you know camera or some other uh, you know e either it's a phone camera or some single photon sensitive camera. Ultimately, that is defined by the pixels. Okay. So your pixel could be 50 micron, 50 micron, or ultimately if you go to analog where you have those, you know, the old age thing, but there the resolution is even better. And that could be even molecular at atomic resolution, you know, few nanometers, few hundred nanometers or a few hundred nanometers. Okay. So, so that decides, 
the effective you know size of that uh, uh, vector at least for the projective measurement but of course uh, when you are in the continuous variable basis i mean you can't really go you know it has to be integrated over some uh, uh, you know area or or or, or distance which is, which is the size of the pixel at least in 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 the case of position measurements yes okay. thanks uh, Sir, so in this case, uh, the projective measurement is at the uh, position basis, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, that. Uh, so uh, I think that's what he was asking. Uh, in what basis are we take the projective measurement? No. So you will take projective measurement in whatever basis you want to. But again, of course, you have to have a detector to actually be able to do that measurement in that basis. For example, everybody knows that, yes, we do have a detector for position. But we, in fact, <laughs> I mean, we don't even have a detector for measuring the momentum, you know. So uh, the way the way momentum is measured is a little bit uh, roundabout. So what do you what do you do? You you put a lens, a convex lens, and when you go to its uh, focal plane or Fourier plane, then you still do position measurement. But the measurement uh, position measurement at, at the Fourier plane is essentially the momentum uh, the, the measurement at the uh, uh, in, in the momentum basis i mean what i mean is I, let me see i can't draw here so if i have position coming in i can't i don't have a detector that i can just put it here so what i do is put a lens see if i can draw so anand this is something which we have yes. uh, so something so what you are saying is that let's say in two dimension if i had this mm -hmm. plus state and minus state right 0 plus 1 by root 2 and 0 minus 1 by root 2. Uh, mm -hmm. Like cat, cat 0 plus cat 1 or cat 0 minus cat 1 normalized. If I want to measure in this basis, then I can actually apply mm -hmm. a header word. So that header word is the Fourier transformation. And then measure in the standard basis. So, so probably position is the standard uh, uh, position, uh, uh, measuring in the position thing. Is the standard basis and measuring in the momentum is this uh, measuring in, in plus minus. So one way to measure momentum is you first apply a Fourier transform and then measure in the standard basis. Probably that's the uh, seems like a very very yes. But I think the thing is that maybe tomorrow one would uh, you know uh, discover a detector where you can do momentum directly. Sure, so sure, sure. E either directly or indirectly, mm -hmm. if you have the idea is that uh, you have to do a projective measurement and then when you do projective measurement, then basically one gets the, uh, you know, the, the basis vector in the Hilbert space that somebody was just talking about, I, don't, I just don't know the name. Mm -hmm. uh, but but so it, it is always projective measurement It's just that for mo uh, position, I do have a detector momentum, I do have a detector, but not as simple as position. Mm -hmm. Again, for orbital angle momentum. Uh, there is not a perfect detector yet. People are still working on a detector, but yeah, we can have detected to some extent, but again, it doesn't go to, you know, very high uh, 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 orbital angular momentum value and so on. And now uh, you were talking about uh, zero, one and the zero plus, uh, zero plus one by root two and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. So this can be, for example, the horizontal polarization, vertical polarization. And when you say zero plus one, zero plus one by root two, that's, uh, let me just see if you can write it. Mm -hmm. For example, this is, let's say, in, in, in polarization, this is just a two dimensional basis. So mm -hmm. one basis could be a horizontal and vertical. Mm -hmm. So again, if you, uh, the, 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 there's a very simple device, it's called polarizing beam splitter. Mm -hmm. This is a piece of glass. <coughs> so, so it is like, if you have a light field coming in mm -hmm. and if it's a horizontally polarized light, it will just go this way. And if it's a vertically polarized light, it will just go this way. So if, if, if you have a state of light, uh, I mean, kit H, or this you can also write as uh, kit zero. Yeah, that's okay. H, yeah. H is zero and V is one. That's one. So th th this, is, this is what's called polarizing beam splitter. This is very simple device, mm -hmm. but uh, if, it is, if it is horizontally polarized light, it goes this way, vertically polarized light, it goes that way. Mm -hmm. But suppose if I use the same device, mm -hmm. and uh, but this time, but again, for, for this device to work, for this device to do the projective measurement, I have to have this prior information that what's incoming here is H or V. I mean, I don't know which one, but it has to be, it's either H or it's a V. And then this device will work perfectly as a projective measurement device. Mm -hmm. But again, if I use the same device for let's say a state like zero, 
plus 1 by 2 or I get to plus minus 1 by root 2 mm -hmm. then this device will not work because this, this this was meant to separate I mean for a device to work as a detector it has to physically separate the basis state here it is doing it here it, it won't do because it, this one separates based on HV basis so this doesn't work for the um, you know, uh, uh, this, this, this we can call 45 minus 45 basis. Mm -hmm. But again, if you rotate the same device, I mean, this is just a simple, uh, uh, you know, solution for this particular one. If you rotate the device at 45 degree, mm -hmm. so if I rotate the same device by 45 degree, mm -hmm. then it becomes a perfect separator for zero plus one, zero plus minus one by row two. And in that, in that case, now this, uh, in this direction, I'll have zero plus one, by root two and in this direction i'll have zero minus one by root two so now this is a perfect device for <coughs> perfect uh, device of making projective measurement in this 45 minus 45 basis right. so to to make a, uh, a projective measurement yes you have to have a detector sometimes it can have a simple implementation sometimes it can have a more difficult implementation but yes you do have to have a device that you know works that way again uh, this is the example for the finite you will have similar situation in the infinite dimensional basis as well so uh, so sorry but if suppose i don't rotate it by 45 degree mm -hmm. and still feed the 0 plus 1 by root 2 state in this mm -hmm. uh, polarized beam splitter then sometimes i will see h sometimes i will see v yes okay yes okay. yes okay. yes okay. and in in that in that case if you if you see it as then you wouldn't know as to what it was here it could it could mm -hmm. be anything so but it, it's just that if you have for example prior information that yes it's either h or v coming and if you detect something over here you know for sure it's h yeah. so and if so you rotate it by 45 sorry go ahead no, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, complete sorry what no, i'm saying if you rotate this by 45 degree and then you detect something here then again you are sure that this is zero plus one by root two and if you detect something here then you know it's zero minus one by root two but if you don't rotate at 45 degree and then you detect something, then it could be anything. <coughs> sir, so, uh, sir, I wanted to ask something that um, uh, uh, suppose we have a beam of light and which is in this state, like uh, one by root two, mm -hmm. uh, get zero plus minus uh, root, uh, root three by one, one by two and root three by two. So, mm -hmm. uh, so when you pass it with normal st standard basis, which which is like zero and one, so will it will it will we get that probability thing? So will the intensity of horizontal be one by four and the other one three by four? Will it be like that? See, uh, what we were discussing. Somebody just pointed out the uh, projective measurement. So this is a device for doing projective measurement. And for projective measurement, we have to have a device that works in a particular basis. H and V makes a complete basis. Uh, zero one makes a complete basis. Zero plus one by root two and zero minus one by root two. That they also make a complete basis. So for each complete basis, I can have a device that works as a projective measurement. Now, if I, for any, any device, uh, device meant for any basis, if I just send in a <coughs> random state, then of course I'll have a probability of getting a photon here and getting probability of getting a photon here. And then as you just said, it will be pro probabilistic. So that probabilistic thing, one can always calculate and see what it is. But here we're just talking about the, the a device for being able to do the projective measurement. And for that device, you have to have that, <coughs> that, that device separates thing in a particular basis. And that's how you can actually do it. But again, of course, if this device, if, you see, if, if it sees any state, of course it will take. <coughs> and in that case, this state will, it won't be that it goes this way or that way. It has the probability of ending up either here or there. And depending on, you know, I don't know, you put it root three or something, it will have more probability here, less here, but it will be, you know, the question of probability, but it, it, it's for sure, it won't be 100% here and 0% there. So, so we, if we have a beam of photons, which are in the same quantum state, so mm -hmm. we will essentially be able to determine which state uh, uh, these photons are, are in. We'll be able to determine the two complex numbers or the two uh, num numbers in the Hilbert space, right? So that will be like a contradiction to what we are studying. No, 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 Ali. So uh, just because we have the probabilities, again, this is an entire branch of study called quantum tomography, which is by measuring some states, you want to figure out exactly what state that is, 
right? And first thing is that let's say you measure, you saw three three photons in one direction, one photon in one direction. Are you sure that the probability is three by four and one by four? Okay. Right. So so you okay. ideally you will have to pass infinite okay. photons to get the complete statistics. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But still, we can be like, <coughs> can be kind of sure that it's near to that value. So, so we can estimate the probability, but we can never be sure of what what state we are in. What was the state of one electron, or sorry, one photon in this case? Yeah. So, see, uh, in this case, as, as I said, the the necessary prior information you have to have. that the state that is incoming from this side is either h or v <clears throat> only then you can have 0% 100% that yes h goes this way v goes this way but if you for example <clears throat> if you send an arbitrary state that's again as rajat was just mentioning it's a quantum state tomography so <clears throat> for arbitrary state it won't work i mean if if i send 0 plus 1 by 2 for example in here then half the time it will go this way half the time it will go that way but to know it is actually 0 plus 1 by root 2 using this detector i will have to do infinite number of measurements only after that i can say is 50% 50% so for any given state in like the two dimension any given state we might have some angle for which it will go like 100% horizontal 100% vertical like uh, sorry uh, say that again given any state we will have some degree by which we can rotate like for the zero and like plus minus state we have 45 degrees so in any given state we might have some angle by which we get the 100% like the that is true that is true no it's not just for <coughs> some state but some basis for example i can have a, as somebody was saying 0 plus 1 by root 3 and then there can be another orthogonal basis you know zero I, i don't know what is what is that but yes for 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 that complete another uh, two dimensional complete basis i can have some other angle uh, you know for which this device works as a <clears throat> perfect detector yes so like uh, like doing it manually might be very tedious and inaccurate but can we maybe have some like device to which rotates it and checks it for like maybe 10 times or 15 times Uh, like for the same angle like given any state and that device like goes to one angle and checks it maybe 10 times and then again to another angle if it gets it maybe 10 by 10 times the same thing so like no no you, 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 you can actually just calculate this is very simple math you can just calculate the <coughs> angle at which it will become a perfect sorter for a given set of bases no no anand they want, they want to solve the opposite problem Uh, they yes. want to solve the opposite problem they want to use the measurement statistics to figure out the state of the photon so they are they are saying that in the course they learned that they could not like by measurement they could not figure out the state but now they are trying to devise ways just by measurement statistics they want to figure out what state they were in. so again uh, this is this what i have here is not quantum state tomography it is it is with the prior information that incoming state is either h or v i mean i don't know whether h or v but one thing one knows is either h or v then only you can have this perfect determination but if you don't have that idea then again uh, as, as you learned in this course it it cannot be done then of course by the number of measurements you can just get the probability uh, that is you know uh, of of the incoming state And I mean, the ID, estimate yeah. of the probability, not even the probability, just some estimate. Estimate, yeah, exactly. I mean, and then it's like how accurate you are in your estimation, and that that will depend on how many measurements you are making. Yes, exactly. And even for rotation, also all those same problems will stay. Yes, 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 yes. What yes, angle yes. you are rotating at? Yes. Even if you have seen ten in one direction, mm -hmm. probably it is ninety-nine percent in one direction and one percent. And how do you distinguish mm -hmm. between that and hundred percent? Yes, 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 so yes, yes, yes. Is, yes. Yeah, so people are ask, people are asking more on quantum state measurement. So let me just point out: this is not quantum state measurement. This is just one aspect of what's called the projective measurement, and this is how you can actually uh, uh, realize projective measurement in a given basis. And this example is for realizing the <coughs> projective measurement in polarization basis, for example. Yes. Right. 
but but quantum state estimation or, or quantum state tomography that's a very 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 difficult problem uh, and here of course is a very very simple example of quantum state tomography that if you know that the incoming state is either h or v then yes you can actually estimate at least in this example you can actually estimate it 100% yeah but if it's a random state uh, some density matrix even not even density matrix a simple state just a different superposition in 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 the basis in which it's not a projective measurement device then it cannot be done all you can get is an estimated probability yes <laughs> any other question here <coughs> thanks okay <clears throat> okay so uh, let me just get rid of this i don't know Probably, I think I wrote on my <laughs> slide. It's yes, how to get, I, 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 how to get it up. But let, let's see if, if we need to. Okay. So now I was discussing this particular state for which position was fixed. Moment was completely uncertain. Similarly, you can have a state <clears throat> of, of of light or a single photon for which the momentum is fixed, um, but position is completely uncertain. <clears throat> so for this state, my, my momentum uncertainty is zero, and the position uncertainty is infinity. But in general, uh, uh, this is what's called the Heisenberg uncertainty relation. This, this, this is for a particular state. This is, a, this is also a, a particular example. But in general, the uncertainty in position times the uncertainty in momentum that has to be greater than h bar by two. So you cannot measure position and momentum with arbitrary accuracy. This product has to be greater than h bar by two. This is called the Heisenberg uncertainty relation. And you have a similar uncertainty relation for any two non-commuting operators and position and momentum are two non-commuting operators. And the point is if they are two non-commuting operators, then they cannot be measured simultaneously with arbitrary accuracy. The maximum accuracy you get is decided by that inequality. Okay, so uh, this is this is uh, quantum 101. This is the very first principle of quantum mechanics. Now this first principle of quantum mechanics was apparently violated uh, in 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 when, when we discuss entanglement, and this is what was pointed out by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen in this 1935 paper. Sorry, so they can. Uh, uh, have a question? Yes. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, uh, when we uh, when we discuss wave diffraction, we have that whatever photon passes through the slit, its position is constrained by the size of the slit, and its momentum is uncertain. Okay, but for the plane wave, we do have the momentum is fixed, but how is the position uncertain? Means the Particle would be traveling in one direction only. So how yeah. is position the uncertain means? Yeah, so, so I, I, I meant the X position. So, I mean, particle could be here, could be there, could be there, could be there. So it could be actually anywhere. So plane wave has an infinite extent. So particle could be actually anywhere. So uh, position is that way, the, the position uncertainty is infinite. <coughs> okay. Is that fine? So actually when you're saying X, <coughs> you need the, like the vertical direction, right? The y yes. Direction. That does X, I mean, yeah, the, usually typical that is Y, but here I have considered that as X. In the left case, when a photon passes through the slit, it can end up anywhere in any direction. Okay, but in the right case, uh, photon would be, in, uh, I mean, at, along moving along one line only, right? So no. how it position can... No, 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 no. This, this, I mean, this, with the three lines, I'm just trying to show it's a plane wave. Uh, so uh, let's like... Uh, I mean, it's like, uh, let's say, let's say take a bulb. I mean, this is not the example of a plane wave. Let's, let's say I take a bulb. Uh, it, it, has a, it, it, it has a surface area, like a bulb has a, has a surface area or, or a tube light, even bigger surface area. Now, if a tube light is to emit a single photon, I mean, because everything emits single photon only. Uh, so now if, if a tube light emits photon, and if you dim the tube lights so much that, you know, it, it's, it's at the single photon level, then where that single photon is coming from in, in one instance, it could be anywhere from that you know, area of the tube light. So, so position uncertainty in case of tube light is really the total area of the, or the length of the tube at, at least in one direction. Okay, so, so plane wave is a, is a theoretical concept. Plane wave, you won't get it practically. Plane wave is just a theoretical concept, which says that you have, you have, a, you, you have, you have a wave, you have a light, with, with the infinite spatial extent e to the i uh, you know kx or e to the i px by h bar that's kind of the wave function that's the infinite x extent but a fixed uh, uh, momentum value is, is that fine 
Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So uh, uh, EPR considered uh, these uh, uh, the system of two particle, the entangled particle, which we suppose they had common parts, and then now they are space like separated. And uh, for this, uh, they considered. Let me. I think just give me one second. I need to get rid of this. Right. <clears throat> so, so they considered a system of two particle, and they considered this particular wave function <clears throat> for the system of two particle. This this wave function is in the uh, let's say the position basis. Again, we don't need to go through that. Uh, the same same uh, uh, the, the 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 wave function of the particle you can write in the momentum basis or or in the position basis. And of course, this wave function cannot be factored as a wave function the first particle particle times the wave function the second particle. Uh, and for this particular wave function or two particle wave function, what they could show, again, I'm not showing the math. What they actually showed in the paper is that suppose you measure particle number two, the position of particle number two, and then ask after measuring particle number two, suppose I find the position of particle two to be somewhere, then what is the uncertainty of the position of particle number one? And that, that's uh, what they call the conditional uncertainty of particle number one. Similarly, if you measure the momentum of the second particle and then look at the momentum of the first particle, then that's the conditional momentum uncertainty of the first particle. <clears throat> and this, they were able to show that this conditional uncertainty product can actually be less than h bar by two. So that means it can actually violate Heisenberg uncertainty relation. And this, they said that this is actually violating the very first principle of quantum mechanics. And for them, this was not acceptable. And then they said, this is this, this feature of quantum mechanics is nonsensical, hence quantum mechanics as a theory is not complete. So that was their objection. Now, I mean, the basic question, is it complete? And then they suggested that, you know, you can have an, some additional variable, it's called hidden variable with which one can develop some new theory, which would be more complete. So this was the, this was the EPR argument for saying uh, uh, quantum mechanics has a, problem or in other words explaining what entanglement actually is at least in uh, this position and momentum basis um, yeah, so is that same um, as entanglement because yes you know. so uh, this this is the very this is called inseparability this is the very basic feature of entanglement this is one way of explaining entanglement okay. that if if the two particle wave function cannot be written like this, that we cannot, you cannot write it as the wave function corresponding to the first particle times the wave function corresponding to the second particle, then that is entanglement. <laughs> this, is just a, this is a very basic definition of entanglement. The other way of looking at it, <clears throat> which is what is, is kind of uh, captured through this, is that uh, entangled basically means simultaneous correlation in two conjugate variables uh, and the inseparability of the two particles state in, into individual particles. I mean, you, you can use either. And uh, uh, simultaneous correlation means the the correlation that was defined by uh, correlation that was defined by or the limit of correlation that was defined by Heisenberg is this, where you have these uh, uh, you know the two non-commuting operators. So this is this is the maximum correlation one can have. But if you have a two-particle system and this conditional uncertainty, <coughs> with that if you can violate this, that means these particles are correlated in X as well as in P, both X and P. And only when you have correlations in, in two simultaneous, uh, uh, sorry, simultaneous correlation, two conjugate basis or two non-committing variables, then we say it is entanglement. <coughs> okay. <coughs> I will do a, a, a version of this in two, uh, for, for, for polarization that is two dimension as well. And maybe it will be, uh, you know, clearer there. So this we talked about entanglement in position momentum. We can similarly have entanglement in time and energy. Now, so time and energy, just like position momentum, they are all conjugate, they are also conjugate variables. And I can have the interpretation that the conditional uncertainty in time times the conditional uncertainty in energy, uh, that has to be less than h bar by two. And if that is the case, then it is entanglement in, in time and energy. Uh, similarly, we can have uh, uh, entanglement in angle and orbital angle momentum. 
So just like position momentum, we have angle and orbital angle momentum. They are also conjugate uh, uh, variables. And if you have the conditional uncertainty in these variables satisfying this relation, then we say it's entangled in angle and orbital angular momentum. Uh, th th this may not be familiar to kind of some of you, but uh, when we say angle, we, we mean by the angular position like this. And when we say orbital angular momentum, uh, we mean like a mode uh, that has this kind of uh, phase dependence, azimuthal phase dependence, it'll be I L phi, where L is an integer uh, going from minus infinity to infinity. And phi is the angular position. And they also make conjugate variable pairs, just like position, momentum, and time and energy. Again, I won't go into much into this, but the, that that also that is also a basis that exists. And in fact, uh, angular orbital angular momentum, this basis is is uh, uh, is is seen as a, having a lot of potential for for quantum information uh, and quantum communication because this provides <clears throat> a basis which is finite dimensional. Uh, unlike polarization, which is, which is just two dimensional, and there are several benefits to having a infinite, sorry, higher dimensional basis uh, as opposed to just two dimensional basis. Um, but again, let's just uh, uh, we, we we won't go to those examples right now. But yeah, so th these are called continuous variable entanglement. But you can also have what's called the polarization entanglement. Polarization entanglement means if I have a state like H H plus V, you may be more familiar with this uh, basis. Now the same basis, same state uh, that here is written in HB basis can be written in the 45 minus 45 basis. <clears throat> and again, we can see that we cannot write this as, you know, the wave function or the ket corresponding to the first particle times the ket corresponding to the second particle. <clears throat> and that is what is meant by polarization entanglement or two dimensional entanglement. Yeah, just, from, okay. uh, just last slide, uh, H you can take it to be zero, V to be one, 45 to be zero plus one by root two and 45 to be zero minus one by root two. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, so this idea that uh, you can uh, entanglement means simultaneous correlation in two conjugate variables. Uh, this, I mean, <coughs> this was the interpretation <clears throat> for a continuous variable. Uh, we, we can have uh, this thing for the two dimensional polarization basis as well. And this have kind of, uh, you, you might have done this already, but uh, uh, th th this is this is kind of understanding entanglement through what it is not. And this is actually uh, very useful, at least uh, this is what I think. Uh, so, so this was based on, the, based on the suggestion by EPR that yes, you can have hidden variables and then you don't need quantum mechanics and that theory will still be able to explain entanglement. <coughs> so here is the attempt. So let's say you have a quantum entanglement and, and, and uh, you know, these two particles that are entangled. Uh, and then we do some uh, experiment or measurement and we look at the experimental measurement, try to explain it through quantum theory and through what's called hidden variable theory. Hidden variable theory means you have two independent sources of uh, photons or particles. You can have very complicated rules between the two sources, but they, these two are completely independent. <coughs> and then again, we'll do some uh, measurement uh, experiment, and then we'll have some experimental outcome. And based on that outcome, we'll try to see if you know, both these theory can explain or just one theory can explain and then we'll see which one is complete, which one is not. <coughs> I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on. Uh, okay, so here is, let's say one experiment. Then the experimenter finds uh, uh, with, with these photons and here the, uh, the, the measurement is made in the polarization basis. So experimenter finds that if the signal photon uh, well, first photon I'm calling signal, the second one calling idler. I can also call it just first photon or second photon. Uh, if the signal photon is measured to be, uh, whenever signal photon is measured to be horizontally polarized, we find that the other one is uh, vertically polarized. And uh, sorry, uh, I said the opposite way. When, whenever signal is horizontal, the other one photon is also found to be horizontal. And whenever signal is measured to be vertical, other photon is also measured to be vertical. Now, this experimental outcome, can we explain through quantum theory? Answer is yes. So suppose we have this kind of wave function coming out of this uh, source of entangled photon. This wave function says, whenever signal is horizontal, idler is horizontal. Whenever signal is vertical, idler is vertical. So this state, if we have, it can explain this measurement outcome. Uh, can hidden variable or two independent sources, uh, can, can that also um, explain this measurement outcome? Answer is yes. How do you do it? So you have two sources, just have few rules. Uh, first rule is that both these sources uh, should emit simultaneously. Uh, 
and so they made the same polarization. If it's H, this guy, the, the other gun should also be H. If it's V, it should be V. And the other rule is that uh, although they will fire, uh, uh, you know, uh, randomly, but 50% of the time, both sources should emit horizontal and 50% of the time, both sources should emit vertical. And with these three simple rules, these two being independent sources, we can explain this measurement outcome. <clears throat> is this entanglement? Actually, no. Uh, let's look at the other measurement outcome. Here, the measurement outcome is that if the signal photon or the first photon is measured to be 45 degree polarized, the other one is also measured to be 45 degree. Whenever signal, and but if the signal is measured to be minus 45 degree polarized, the other one or the idler is also measured to be minus 45 degree polarized. Can we explain it, this measurement outcome using quantum theory? The answer is yes. So if you have a wave function, which looks like this 45, 45 plus minus 45, minus 45, then you should be able to explain this measurement outcome. Can two independent sources do it? The answer is yes. And what are the rules they need? These are the rules they need that both sources uh, emit simultaneously and emit the same polarization. 50% of the time it should be 45 degree polarization, 50% of the time it should be minus 45 degree polarization. Now, is this entanglement? Again, no. Third uh, uh, measurement. In this, we have, if the signal photon is measured to be horizontally polarized, idler is horizontally polarized. If signal is vertically polarized, idler is vertically polarized. At the same time, if the signal is measured to be 45 degree polarized, idler is 45 degree polarized. And if the signal is measured to be minus 45 degree polarized, idler is minus 45 degree polarized. So it's correlation, not only in a horizontal vertical basis, but also in 45 minus 45 basis. So can uh, quantum theory explain such measurement outcome? Answer is yes. So if I take a wave function like this, H, H plus VV. Now this wave function, if you just do the basis transformation can also be written as well, uh, there's one over root two here, can also be written as 45, 45 plus minus 45 minus 45. So uh, this wave function can be written in the 45 minus 40, 45 basis like this. So of course, with this wave function, we can explain this entire measurement outcome. Now the uh, question is, can uh, uh, such sources do, two independent sources? What are the rules we need? And the challenge is that you, cannot make a set of rules, even if you're given, you know, if you're allowed to have some infinite number of rules, you cannot have a set of rules uh, that you can define between the two sources and be able to reproduce this measurement outcome. This is just impossible. And is this entanglement? Yes, this is entanglement. So the main point is that uh, horizontal and vertical basis, that's like conjugate to 45 minus 45 basis. And here we see correlation in horizontal vertical basis as well as in 45 minus 45 basis. So whenever we have correlation, simultaneous correlation in two different conjugate bases, that's when we have entanglement. And that is the sure uh, feature uh, or signature of entanglement. Sorry, and again, when, yes. When you say conjugate basis, non-commuting is equivalent or it's one way to generate? It's, it's, it's e equivalent, but in, in the, in the two dimensional basis, we dip, uh, I mean, uh, uh, we, 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 we don't put polarization in, in that sense, but yeah, uh, it, it, the, they're pretty similar. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, uh, uh, so then there is uh, kind of very brief histories in, in, in that was the paper was in 1935, then around 1950s. Uh, actually, David Bohm constructed hidden variable theories at that point, but uh, you know nobody could find out whether this theory is correct or if quantum was correct. Then in 1964, there is Bell inequality uh, that Bell proposed an inequality, and if you could violate it, then quantum mechanics would be correct. If you cannot, then hidden variable would be an alternative uh, a theory. But then, starting 1980s, there were several experiments that showed violation of Bell inequality, and now you know, to very people are still working on those experiments. But now it's kind of established that yes, quantum theory is is okay. And then, uh, in fact, whether quantum theory is okay or not, that we still don't have very consensus. But hidden variable theories, these are not an alternative to quantum mechanics. That is uh, pretty much well established. Okay, so now uh, uh, this is more of the uh, uh, fundamental aspect. Now I just want to talk one, uh, uh, you know, source of entangled photon, and, and I will discuss only one. This is called parametric down conversion, and because this is the most widely used one, there are other sources. Uh, one of them is called four-way mixing process that also produces entangled photon. But but I'll just discuss this one. This is a this is a non-linear optical process, uh, in which you have a kind of like a laser. <coughs> with uh, let's say blue photon, uh, uh, lo lower, lower wavelength, and that blue photon with lower wavelength hitting a nonlinear optical crystal. 
and uh, breaking up into two red photons. So one photon breaking up into two. Uh, uh, I mean, it is absorbed by the crystal. Uh, you see a dashed line. That means it's not a real state. It's a metastable state, virtual state. And then, so that means the process is very, very, very inefficient. But uh, uh, I mean, the efficiency is like 10 to the minus nine. So every 10 to the nine photon, only one of them get down converted and, and, and uh, break up into this entangled signal and idler photon. So, I mean, this is a traditional name. When this pump uh, breaks is, we call it, first one is signal, the second one is idler. <coughs> and these two are entangled. Uh, so in this process, you of course have to conserve energy. That means the energy of the um, pump has to equal to the energy of the signal idler. Of course, there is no constraint on what could be the energy or frequency of the signal, but if, if the signal is WS, then idler has to be WP minus WI. So energy is conserved. Similarly, the momentum is also conserved, that the momentum of the first photon, uh, or signal photon plus the momentum of the idler photon has to be equal to the momentum of the uh, pump photon. And since momentum is a vector, you can have this momentum conservation in, in different ways. It, it, it could either be that, you know, in, in the same direction, that's called collinear, uh, both going in the same direction and then adding up to the momentum of the pump, or they can both go in opposite directions <coughs> or different directions and then add up to the pump momentum. And sorry, uh, just one thing I want to clarify probably for myself also. Yeah. And then there's another question on the chat. So first thing I want to say is that, okay, so, so uh, as you mentioned that uh, as experiments predict that there should be entanglement or entanglement is one very nice way to explain what we see in the experiment and that entanglement is defined in quantum mechanics. And now you are telling us how physically we can actually uh, make two photons entangled, right? Yes, 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 yes. Right? Uh, yes. Th thanks. So, yeah, just, so, so, uh, this is what exactly what we wanted. <laughs> so thanks. Yes. So the uh, up until now, it was just the basic theory covering basic aspects of entanglement and measurement. Measurement aspect I have not covered very nicely. No, 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 no. Uh, I mean, th th there was not the there was not the plan, but yeah, through discussion we covered it. Now we are discussing one physical process by which these entangled uh, uh, photons can be produced. Yeah. Again, uh, we'll discuss a little bit of entanglement in in in, in those uh, three continuous variables that we uh, discuss and the experiments that have been carried out to kind of uh, uh, you know verify the entanglement in those bases. Well, thanks. You know, the previous episode was very very helpful. There's a long question in the chat, so. <laughs> I can read it, but probably it might be helpful if you read it and answer. Okay, let me just look at the. <clears throat> yeah, I, I'm. Uh, let me just. So I think, unless I get the arrow, probably I don't see. The... So, uh, Dheeraj, can you just uh, unmute your mic and ask the question directly? Where has my Where has my chat gone? I think I need to come out of the uh, presentation. Yeah, I mean, you, 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 you just say it, huh? You just say it. That we, uh. Dheeraj, yeah. Why don't you unmute and ask the question? Hello. Yes, sir. Hmm. Sir, I wanted to ask that uh, when we talk about a single photon coming out of a tube light, uh, does it mean that uh, the photon is coming out of the whole surface area? Or is it the... Um, uh, because of the measurements part, measurement part that we are observing it as coming out of the full surface area of the tube light. Uh, that's the only way to find out, right? Like measurement is the only way to figure out what is going on, right? Uh, Rajat, uh, so, I mean, I think somebody also asked this question. So why don't I, I mean, let me just get out of this PowerPoint presentation. And since again, since as I said, I'm not under pressure of finishing this. Sure, uh, sure. I, I, just, I just want to show a video. Sure. And since we are here, we can probably do. Um, Okay, uh, can you see my screen? 
So uh, we see your presentation. You might have only shared the presentation. Okay. You might have share the okay. entire screen. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sir. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see my screen now? No, you see the screen. Yeah. Okay. So here, uh, this is this is an experiment we did in the lab. Uh, here you have a light coming out of two physical double slit. Uh, I mean, a double slit has some, uh, you know, uh, some size. I mean, at least one millimeter or something, at least the width of it. And then we look at a camera. This is a 512 by 512 uh, uh, camera, uh, but this is a single photon sensitive camera. So uh, if, you, if you look at the highlight level, I'll show you that picture as well. Uh, what you will see is something like this. I mean, of course, a very uniform version of this. But if you look at very low light level uh, on, on, on the camera, then we let me just play this as a video. You see this dots, individual dots appearing. Uh, and these are individual single photons. So if you are talking about the shape of a photon, when you detect it, these are, that's the shape of the photon, 16 micron by 16 micron. That's the size of my pixel. But if you are talking of the shape of the photon before detecting it, then, I mean, let me just, uh, so at least by looking at the dots, you, I, I mean, I, I, you, you can get convinced that, you know, here things are doing one by one. Uh, and then uh, now we increase the speed of acquisition. Let me just speed it up more, otherwise it will take. So now you can see some pattern emerging. If I go more, some, pat, some more pattern. Uh, so, yeah, so, so that's the pattern. And this is the pattern we have collected over one hour, although I just took some 20 seconds, but this is the pattern collected over one hour. So now you still, even though you can see this pattern here, which is the double slit pattern and people who have done any optics experiment, they would be familiar with this kind of a, you know, a fringe pattern, the Young's double slit uh, pattern. But you can still see these are dotted pattern, lots of dot, and these are individual photons. Well, in, in some cases, this is, let's say, brighter. So maybe two photons have fallen or, or few photons have fallen on, on the same pixel. Nevertheless, you could still see the dotted structure. So if you make a measurement on the photon, you will see it as a dot in the position basis. And that dot is the size of the pixel. But if you, unless you have met, make, make the measurement, the photon, the shape of the photon to the best possible way that we can express it, the shape of the photon is actually this entire fringe pattern. Okay, so when it's coming out of the tube light, yes, it's a shape is whatever is the surface area of the tube light, but when you detect it, of course, you will find it coming out of some point in the tube light. So that's the wave particle duality. And we say that it is correct. I mean, both the statements are correct simultaneously. That photon is here as well as everywhere. Does that answer the question? But here the photons, there is not a single photons. They are very large number of photons. No, but I collected it one by one. For example, mm -hmm. if I go to the very beginning, now you see this is just one, let me just stop it. So at this point, I just have a 10, 15. So at this point, you don't see any pattern, right? There's one here, one there, one there, one there, one there. So it is, it is one by one. And at this point, you just cannot guess what pattern is going to come out. So of course, in order to be able to see the entire wave function or the structure, you will have to collect a lot of photon, but every photon is coming with the same wave function. <coughs> is that fine? Yeah, okay, I get somehow. Yeah, this, <laughs> this is the most strange aspect of quantum mechanics and that is a wave particle duality. So as long as it is, it is a wave. You can say that it has this structure, you know, that it, 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 it is in this shape and that is the wave function, uh, uh, you know, the amplitude of the wave function, so to say. Uh, but a photon, the moment you make a measurement, you will find it either here, here, here. Of course, if you collect it for a finite amount of time, then you find that, okay, probability of finding it is here is more than the probability of finding it over here. But nevertheless, when you detect, you detect the entire photon, you don't detect half of it. So when you make a measurement, a photon behaves as a particle, but when it propagates without the measurement, then it behaves just like a wave. I mean, you have this entire wave pattern. And that's the wave particle duality aspect. And that is at the core of, uh, you know, uh, quantum mechanics, yes. 
So Anand, this was done in your lab, like in yes, yes, yes. These are all Kanpur photons. Yeah, these are very local Kanpur photons. Yes. Oh, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me uh, go back to the presentation. So, like, uh, yes. what did you use to like uh, get a single photon? Oh, so uh, here I haven't done very fancy single photon source really. It's just a simple laser, but you attenuate it so much that you have only one photon per resolution time of the camera. So this video, we have done it very slowly. So you, the, and, and the camera that I have is single photon sensitive camera. It's a 90% quantum efficiency camera. The pic, number of pixels are not great. It's, it's much lower than what you have in your camera. This is 512, 512, so I think 0.25 megapixel but each pixel is single photon sensitive. But the source wise is just a, a, a five milliwatt uh, helium neon laser, which you attenuated so much that per resolution time of the camera or detection time of the camera, uh, you have on an average less than one photon. So there can be many time window in which there, there, there are actually no photons. Yeah, so that way you make sure it's whenever it comes, you know, it's either just one photon. Sir, I had a question that uh, uh, in photoelectric effect, um, uh, 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 the photon acts like a particle, right? And over there, we're not like du during the like before the measurement, we before before the measurement of the electron on the other side and stuff like that. We assume that the photon is acting like a particle and uh, imparting its energy to the electron because of which it comes out of the metal, right? But you just now said that for photon acts like a wave when it <coughs> propagates. But and when it when we measure it, it uh, it is measured as a particle. So isn't it different from what you're saying? Okay, I take that back then. If you <laughs> if you don't like it, I take that back. I mean the 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 most correct statement is that a photon behaves as a particle and as a wave simultaneously all the time. So when you're looking at only at its wave aspect, maybe that's what shows up. When you're looking at only at the particle aspect, maybe that's what shows up. But the best way of putting it, I mean, the moment you kind of make the, you know, uh, uh, the, the, uh, this kind of statement, there could be confusion. Uh, the, the best statement, and which, which would be the most nonsensical, but the best statement would be that the photon behaves as a particle and as a wave simultaneously. So it, it's here and everywhere at the same time. I mean, that's the best statement, you know, non-confusing, unambiguous statement, but of course it's the most nonsensical, but it is actually true, yes. Yeah, so, sorry, but uh, yeah, I want to say that uh, yeah, we can go to foundations of quantum mechanics, and then there are a lot more questions. But uh, uh, yeah, these 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 questions, uh, let's uh, probably we can ask them after the talk. But uh, I'm waiting for more things which which are related yes. to so, <laughs> and how to entanglement is done. So questions about foundations of quantum mechanics, right? All of us understand that oh, quantum mechanics is true or not true. There are a lot of discussions, a lot of debates. Let's do it afterwards. Probably. Yeah. So. Yeah. Again, as I said, I am not under pressure, but again, uh, I have to follow what uh, the instructor is saying. So let's go to the. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the problem is that whenever the discussion yes. comes to the foundation of quantum mechanics, <laughs> other things don't get covered. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So I have to follow what the instructor is saying. Yes. <laughs> All right, so uh, yeah, so we were here uh, and uh, right. So so this this process is a very base, uh, you, you can see my screen, Rajat, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, huh? so this process is called the, uh, is, is very basic nonlinear optical process. Uh, so the this is the very basics of nonlinear optics. Uh, I mean, if, if you have an atom, an atom in an electric field, <clears throat> the, the uh, if, if you put an atom in electric field, the positive charge nucleus center, sorry, the, the positive uh, positively charged nucleus and the this negatively charged electron cloud, you know, they get separated from each other. And, and that gives you the dipole moment. Dipole moment per unit volume is a polarization. So this typically this polarization is proportional to the electric field. But if this is electric field is very strong or is strong enough, depending on which material we have, then we find that the polarization not only has this uh, uh, term which is just proportional to e, but it also gets the terms that are proportional to e squared, e cubed, and so on. That's called the second order nonlinear effect. This is called the third order nonlinear effect, and so on. So the second order nonlinear effect is given by uh, polarization being dependent on e squared uh, of the field. So if you look at the very basic nonlinear uh, second order nonlinear optical process, uh, so this is second order nonlinear polarization is e, e naught epsilon naught. 
uh, chi two e squared. Let's not go into what these things are, but polarization is proportional to e squared. And let's say the field has two frequencies, it be i omega one t and omega two t. So with this field, if we just analyze, analyze what the polarization is, then we take this field, we and it's a complex conjugate part as well. We square it, and then it has a total of sixteen terms. So which can be written like this. Now, if you look at this term, this has no frequency dependence. So you will have a DC type polarization. Then you have a <coughs> in the polarization you have a component which is twice omega one. And twice omega two, so this is called second harmonic generation. So if you have a material which is uh, which has second order non-linearity, uh, if you if you pump it or if you put in electric field or if you shine it with a light which has frequency omega one, what will what can come out is actually frequency om two omega one. So you will generate a frequency light at twice the frequencies. And again, if I have second frequency, I'll have also generated as uh, twice omega two. Like I also have this uh, term that is omega one plus omega two, so this is called some frequency generation. You can also have difference frequency generation. <coughs> so these are all nonlinear optical effect coming from the very basic uh, uh, polarization physics. So this difference frequency generation is what is I mean parametric down conversion is one of the difference frequency generation uh, methods. So here I have this nonlinear medium. I come in with a pump omega one. Now I don't have the second frequency like I have it here over here omega two, but we know that the vacuum modes uh, the, the, there are these vacuum modes. Uh, that means you have all these frequencies available, but no no uh, energy in there. But you can have those vacuum modes, and one of the modes if it has a frequency omega three, then you can generate photons at omega two. So I mean even if, if even without vacuum mode description, if you, if you pump it with a, a frequency omega one. And if it has a probability of generating omega three, then the second photon will get generated as omega one minus omega two, or the vice versa, so that the energy is conserved and so on. So this is the process of parametric down conversion. And again, I haven't shown it, but these two are supposed to be entangled in in uh, position momentum, polarization, time energy, and you know what not. Okay. <coughs> So this is one physical process by which you can generate polarization. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, entangled photons. Uh, whether it is entangled in polarization, time, energy, position, momentum, one has to do certain things and to make sure that yes, you do have entanglement in those direction. But here I'll just show you. And these again, we 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 have seen that in the lab. And if somebody is interested, maybe when the you know times are a little normal, uh, you know you are invited to visit my lab, and I can show you how this actually works in the lab. So here. We have a laser, uh, a nonlinear crystal, and then if you rotate this crystal, you can generate uh, this entangled photon in different uh, configurations. So here's some, you know, parameter of this crystal, and uh, this this tilt of this crystal, the rotation of this crystal, you know, this theta p, if it is 28.64, I mean, you you don't need to know that number; it's just some number. You see in the camera that you have, you see this kind of light coming out. If you increase the theta p a little bit, you see that blob opening up and becoming like a ring. And if you analyze, uh, you will find whenever you have a photon uh, coming over here, the second photon comes over there. I mean, it's diametrically opposite. The photon comes over there, the, the other one comes over there. So the the entangled photons comes at in, uh, diametrically opposite points. Now, if you keep on increasing this theta, uh, after a while, this one goes away. But then a new a new pattern starts emerging, and that in that case we'll have theta equal to 40 degree. You'll have these two blobs coming out, and if you <coughs> then keep on increasing theta p, the blobs will turn into uh, rings, and then actually overlap. So uh, this is called type one entangled photons, type one polarization entangled photons rather. So as I said, these are diametrically opposite points, but they have they they have same polarization, either H H or V whatever. So same polarization. On the other hand, in this configuration, uh, I have uh, what's called type two entangled photons. That means if this is horizontal, this is vertical. Uh, again, diametrically opposite. That means if you take this as a center, so if you get one photon over there, second one would be over there. <coughs> so this is. <coughs> I'm so sorry for this one. You're okay, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No. No. That. That. <laughs> that, that way, I'm fine. It's just the. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Right. So, so uh, this diametrically opposite points; these are entangled. So now, if you keep on going and let's look at this configuration, 
so the these two are again diametrically opposite point but let's say if you count this uh, ring which is horizontally polarized or this ring uh, is vertically polarized let's say let's start with this ring so this point if we are at and if this part of this ring then that's horizontally polarized the then the diametrically opposite point is this and since it's coming from the other one it will be vertically polarized but this point can also be contributed by this ring and in that case it will be vertical and hence this will be horizontal so if you just choose these two points then you get what's called h v plus v h uh, entangled state and this all can be produced in the lab just by turning or, or rotating this particular cluster okay uh, by yes basically choosing only those two points you said that if you choose only those yes two so if 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 you for example if you choose uh, if you choose let's say uh, this point and that point mm -hmm. then the state you have is h v right if you choose uh, this point and that point mm -hmm. then the state you have is h h h but if you choose Uh, again if you choose this point and that point you still have hv but if you choose this point mm -hmm. and that point then mm -hmm. the state you have is hv plus vh so when you say choose you mean like you you look at the photons which have lighted at that point yes so you kind of like put a uh some diaphragm that you are selecting photons only from that area yeah yeah and that's right this goes to one detector and that goes to another detector and then you you know and those two detectors are uh, doing projective measurements in the polarization basis and so then uh, you you'll find that it is actually this again if to find that this this is the state you will have to do something uh, to 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 actually make a measurement but yes uh, ultimately with the measurement you can actually verify that yes this is the state that you get uh, but from if you choose only this two point you, that's the state you can get and so uh, only with this two points you can get this uh, polarization entangled state Mm -hmm. there there is a way of uh, doing an h h plus v v as well so it's like on oh, this is in my h h ring and somehow if i could do an v v ring on top of this then that will become a h h plus v v state which is what we do you know in in the next few slides that there was a very first or second experiment on polarization entanglement bell inequality that was done uh, but yeah so this is this is one physical process in which by which you can actually have this state probably uh, like whatever 0011 is the same thing as h h plus v v and and that's how it is done in the lab okay uh, uh, sir yes uh, sir here if we uh, are using only a single crystal uh, then the patterns are like this but uh, what if we are using two different crystals and uh, the light is uh, projected at the same position uh, on the screen uh yes then... so that's a very good question give me few slides uh i and i will get there okay uh, uh sir uh, but i just yes. want to confirm one thing mm -hmm. uh, like in uh, one of the earlier slides you were uh, demonstrating uh, entanglement by using two different sources which were uh, connected by no uh, you were uh, actually uh, denying entanglement by using two different sources which were connected by some rules okay yeah yeah uh, yes uh, and uh, so is it uh, is using two different crystals similar to uh, similar to using two different sources no which no 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 uh, so this is like uh, this source will do uh, produce first photon and this source will produce a second photon okay so the first one is being produced by this second one is being produced by this these two are completely independent but when we are talking here yeah when we are talking here it is single crystal and it produces both these photons but of course they are in this shape that yes diametrically opposite is like h h and as you said if i let's say just add another crystal over there uh, uh, and I, i guess i will i will have to do some more few more things if i add just this crystal and if i adjust it the second one in such a way that i have the state i have is the v v ring from the second crystal okay and then if there is no we have distinguishing whether the two photon came from this crystal or that crystal that means that if the crystals are thin enough then the state that you will actually produce is hh plus vv okay so uh, so this is a two particle state that is a two particle state so you don't have a one particle state and a one particle state this is a two particle state coming from the first crystal 
two particular set coming from the second crystal and and a superposition of that uh, this is uh, by assuming that we are uh, we aren't able to uh, distinguish the uh, source of the photon uh, which crystal it is coming from we are assuming that uh, yes okay yes <clears throat> then we can say that the state is entangled by uh, cho by choosing two different points well uh, th this is this is one way uh, by this two crystal geometry this is one way of making such state hh plus bv because you know that hh plus bv is an entangled state hmm. so physically how you do it this is one way of doing it the other the, and this is the other way of doing it you still have a single crystal but you rotate it to let's say 41 degree in in, in the lab this one was at 28 degree and then then you have to put another crystal here with 41 degree i can <coughs> rotate in crystal to 41 degree i can produce this hh H, sorry hv plus vh and and that is also an entangled state so these are different geometries by which you can get these entangled states produced in the lab yes okay okay uh, and sir uh, in the uh, second last picture mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, if uh, we have uh, we have just uh, the two circles tangentially touching mm -hmm. uh, then what will be the state at the at that uh, point of contact then this will actually be very close to hv plus vh but then you won't be able to distinguish uh, you know uh, this hv plus places. yes so this uh, in this configuration it, it will not be a very useful uh, you know entangled state but in this config because you at, actually at, at the end of the day you want to uh, analyze or make measurements on the two photons independently yes you know? sir so here both the, since both the photons are together you won't be able to make independent measurements on them hence for example in this configuration configuration you won't be able to do bell inequality violation because you can't set up the experiment but hence here if these two are separate you can set up an experiment to do bell inequality violation or any eckert protocol or whatever protocol you want because now you have these two independent detectors two independent photons and you can you know uh, uh, look at it uh, separately but again the 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 entangled photons when they are together they also have some applications in fact this called quantum lithography where you do want them to be together so yeah so different uh, uh, you know uh, photons or states have different applications but if you want to do have this state and be able to make independent measurements then you would go with this geometry and not with that geometry okay thank you sir okay okay so uh, right so here uh, well we we looked at you know these uh, entanglement continuous variable and then in in polarization entanglement and you know one source with which you can produce entanglement okay rajat i think it's already so should i continue or what do you suggest i mean i'm fine but it's 450 so yeah so uh, that is the first thing uh, so you are fine uh, i am completely fine what about uh, other people is there anyone who has the uh, issue if we continue with this now Uh, so I think it's still going to be recorded, right? So it's not a problem, I guess. Yeah, so it is going to be recorded, and please feel free if you have some other assignment or engagement, please feel free to leave the meeting. Uh, let's because this is a great opportunity for us. Uh, Anand is with us, so let's let's take advantage. Uh, and if Anand is fine, so Anand, I leave it to you. Whenever you get tired. <laughs> okay. <you> can, uh, <laughs> okay. all right okay let's see how far we can go i think i'm just one third my way but i think we can speed up uh, now uh, uh, but again as i said you don't uh, have to complete you can uh, exactly can... Since, since since i declared in the very beginning i don't have to complete yes so we can stop whenever we are tired yes okay so uh, so this was about a source that can produce these entangled photons uh, so now what are the different ways in which people have made measurements as far as verifying entanglement is concerned so there are two generic ways for verifying entanglement one is called the epr correlation measurements uh, and and this is basically showing uh, this kind of conditional uncertainty uh, 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 violating this h bar by 2 limit and that's called the epr correlation measurements and this is suitable for verifying entanglement in continuous variable system in position momentum time energy and so on the other method is by demonstration of bell inequality violation and probably we have already done bell inequality violation and this is for suitable for verifying entanglement in finite dimension system i mean two qubit state two qubit state uh, physically if you have a uh, polarization basis will give you two qubit state if you go to orbital angular momentum basis or some atomic states you can also get two qubit states two two qubit here i mean you probably uh, most of you already know two particle or two party 
bit means two dimensional uh, quantum states. Okay, so I will not go through Bell inequality. Everybody knows Bell inequality. Uh, it means you have some Bell parameter and as long as that Bell parameter is uh, greater than two, we say the violation uh, Bell inequalities have been violated. Uh, okay, so let me just show you different experiments that have been done uh, for verifying entanglement in continuous variable basis. So first of all, uh, position momentum entanglement. So this was the experiment uh, done. Uh, I mean, this is the state of the photon produced by down conversion. Again, and I will not go into, I, I'm just showing it, the wave function here is that, you know, that just to show that, yes, people do know how to derive it and it, it is all there if somebody is interested. Uh, you, you can actually derive how it, uh, you know, quantum mechanical as to how it comes from a, a parametric down conversion. So this was the experiment done in 2004. Uh, here you have this BBO crystal and uh, this is type two down conversion. And this is the, this is the one in which uh, it is pretty much coming collinear. That, that means uh, you know, when, when the two rings were just tangentially touching each other. Uh, and in this configuration, uh, one photon goes this way, the other one, one goes this way. And now by putting, uh, putting a slit, very narrow slit, 0 0.04 uh, millimeter, you put the slit here, fix it, that's the first photon. And then you slide the same size slit, but you kind of uh, slide it across to see what is the position uncertainty of the second one uh, condition on the first one. And then people actually measure it experimentally that the condition uncertainty is 0 0.027 millimeter. Similarly, then you put a, uh, you, you do a momentum measurement and for that you have to put a lens and then do very similar measurement. And in this case, what do you find? That becomes the conditional momentum uncertainty. And then people found that the Delta X, Delta P this was actually 0 0.1 h bar, which is less than 0 0.5 h bar. So this was the first demonstration of position momentum entanglement uh, in, 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 in the language of EPR. Uh, there was this experiment that was done in time energy. Again, I'm writing this state, and this, this state is written in the frequency basis to show that this is the state entangled in time energy. Uh, this, is, this is done in 2018. So you can see this is when people are still working on such experiments. Uh, <clears throat> this is again based on parametric down conversion. Again, I'm not going to go through all these details. Time is a, when you do measurements in time and, uh, you know, uh, energy based frequency basis, it's, it's quite difficult. And that's why you see uh, this to be a very complicated experiment. But at the end of the day, uh, they do this energy measurement, conditional energy measurement, and then conditional time measurement. And then they show that the uh, the product of these two conditional uncertainties is 0 0.29 h bar, which is again less than h bar by two. So this was the um, uh, first convincing demonstration of time energy in time as of 2018. In 2020, just last year, uh, people produced uh, 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 this experiment. This one is actually not parametric down conversion. This is what's called a four wave mixing. Uh, this is a different geometry. This is also, uh, again, a nonlinear optical effect, but this is different, different geometry. And here people produced, again, I'm not going to go through the details. Um, <coughs> this conditional uncertainty was shown to be 0 0.063 h bar. So much better than this one, factor of um, you know, five or something. Yeah. Uh, so this is again a violation of uh, the e e EPR, EPR uh, uncertainty. In fact, in principle, this, this actually can be zero. Uh, this, this condition uncertainty can be zero, but this is the, this is the best uh, experimental result that people have been able to get at least in the time energy basis. Um, so the last one is the angular position or right angular momentum basis. This is my favorite. Um, and then this was, this section was done in 2010, again, based on parametric down conversion. Uh, I mean, you use different experiments, uh, different experimental you know, equipment, but the idea is the same that you want to measure the conditional or right angular momentum and conditional angle, put it together and you find that the condition uncertainty is 0.15 h bar less than h bar by two. So this is uh, showing the verification of entanglement in angle or right angular momentum basis. So again, that was okay. the basis, but uh, discrete. Like, yes, like, yes. So yeah, so the, the, the yeah, so th th this is an example of an infinite dimensional basis, but discrete. And this one, as far as quantum computation uh, information is concerned, this one people are definitely thinking of, you know, people are thinking of high dimensional quantum cryptography using orbital angular momentum. And looks like there are several benefits, including, you know, higher error, error tolerance and so on. Uh, so yeah, but again, it will probably take a few more years before people are able to kind of implement those. 
so yeah so far it was either continuous variable basis or infinite dimensional uh, discrete basis uh, here but in when you come to the uh, uh, two dimensional basis or finite dimensional basis then you can do what's called the bell inequality violation uh, i just want to show the very first experiment that was done so in 1981 this was by ellen aspey uh, this is using atomic beams this is the very first experiment that was done for showing the violation of bell inequality uh, but more convincing experiments were done uh, you know a little later like in 1995 Uh, so this is with the type 2 polarization entangled photon that i was just showing so there's two rings overlapping at these two points then you pick up these two photons from that those those, those two locations and then they were able to show bell inequality violation this s was 2.2.55 uh, so again less than 2.82 hence the violation of bell inequality again somebody suggested can we do it with two different crystals yes that was the configuration used in 1999 Uh, and with this well this one gave h v v h but this configuration here you have one crystal <coughs> and the <coughs> second crystal rotated 90 degree with respect to the first one and you come in with a 45 degree polarized light so this light either gets down converted in this one or down converted in that one when it gets down converted in this one it produces h h when it gets gets down converted in this one it produces v v and if the crystals are thin enough then effectively the state that you produce is hh plus vv and then with this state also uh, people were able to show violation of bell inequality this was much better violation this is goes to 2.70 so again uh, these are just different configurations uh, for 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 making you know the states that you want and these are not the only two configurations uh, you know that can give you entangled photons sorry uh, the, the polarization entangled states there can be infinite number of configurations by which one can produce state uh, in customized state that one can actually produce uh, these two are just the uh, uh, two examples but they are very famous except them because they were reported you know um, okay now so far it was about the very, uh, violation of bell inequality uh, in in um, uh, in in polarization and continuous variable now i also want to do uh, uh, you know violation of bell inequality in in finite dimension but using a basis that is actually in finite dimension so for example if i want to make a <clears throat> if i want to make use of the position momentum entanglement can i make a two qubit state in the momentum basis the answer is yes but but here <clears throat> since we will not be using the complete hilbert space it will have some issues that i don't want to go into but the answer is one can actually make a two qubit state also using momentum basis for example i have this photon coming out of down conversion and i can choose these uh, four sorry, yes just, uh, so q1 q1 and q2 are not the only basis vectors in this the hilbert space is much bigger dimension yes. we're just picking two basis states right yes 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 so again just because this is not a complete basis again it will have a you know other issues uh, and that that's called the post selection and things but uh just for the proof of principle demonstration purposes one can actually make two qubit state even using momentum basis which is actually uh, you know an infinite dimensional basis but yes one can actually make uh uh uh, uh two qubit state using this as, uh, also and how do you do it you just physically put this uh, uh you know the openings or diaphragms uh, that select these directions and just by choosing just these two directions and not uh, and nothing else you can actually get the state in in momentum basis and this was done in 1990 and using that you can actually show a violation of bell inequality in the momentum basis you can have two qubit state in the position basis same deal uh instead of uh, choosing direction you can choose different locations again you have to put a lens to go from uh, position to to momentum to position and so on but yes you can actually make a state in the position basis i like a two qubit state in the in the position basis in the moment you are able to make two qubit state you can do bell inequality violation so you can do similar things in time energy uh, so for example this was a two qubit state done this is 2002 in the time bin basis you define the time uh, uh, bins very small time bins and using that uh, again i don't want to go through this whole detail but the idea is same uh, so by defining time bins you can actually uh, make uh, this qubit uh, state this was in frequency uh, i mean I, what i'm trying to show is that uh, the basic ingredient in quantum information and quantum communication at least at this point is a two qubit state and these are the different implementations of two qubit state so again depending on what you want to do 
uh, either you will use the two qubit state in these bases or two qubit state just in the polarization basis or maybe in the orbital angular momentum basis, which, whichever suits for a particular application. But these are different um, ways one can have the implementations of two qubit states. Uh, even in the, you can have two qubit state in the angle basis. Here you can have an aperture like this uh, in coming from down conversion, you can put an aperture like this. So if the photon, first photon goes this way, second one goes this way, first goes this way, second goes this way, and then you can have a state like this. Similarly for the orbital angular momentum. And these all these experiments have actually been done. And this is just going towards using two qubit quantum computation and quantum uh, communication. Okay. So, uh, so far it was about, uh, you know, a source physical, physical process that can produce entangled photons. And then we looked at how one can verify entanglement in the continuous variable basis using EPR correlation and in the finite dimensional basis using Bell inequality. Uh, what I have shown so far, just the making of this two qubit set that there was just an attempt to show, you know, the different ways in which two qubit states can, can be uh, generated, made experimentally. And the moment you have two qubit state, uh, there are several quantum computation and communication applications. So, but let's say uh, I will not go into those uh, uh, you know, applications. I just want to kind of show what can be, what are the different physical implementations of these two qubit state. But what I do want to talk about uh, a little bit are these applications, one's called quantum lithography, quantum cryptography, quantum teleportation, quantum imaging. Just I'll, I'll be very quick uh, in some of these applications you might already know. Uh, so first quantum lithography. So quantum lithography is a very, uh, I mean, this got uh, uh, you know, people looking at these entangled photons very seriously. So uh, this is this is coming from the, coming from uh, this particular effect that's called Hong or Mandel effect. So if you have two entangled photons arriving at a beam splitter, then there are two pos four possibilities that both the photons, I mean, one photon goes this way, the other one goes this way, one photon goes this way, other one goes this way, or two more possibilities, and both the photons go this way, both the photons go that way. But it turns out that if the total path length, this and that, if these two path lengths are exactly equal, then these two possibilities are not there. Uh, and you end up with only these two possibilities. That means if the two photons arrive simultaneously to beam split, two entangled photons arrive simultaneously to beam splitter, then they both either go this way or go that way. This is also called the bunching of photons. So if you look at these two photons in coincidence, that means you detect one here and in, uh, simultaneously detect the second one, that's called the coincidence event. If you look at the coincidence, then when this X is zero, that means when there is no uh, 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 path length difference between this and that, then you see there's no coincidence because both the photons are either going this way or going that way. Hence, there's no uh, possibility, probability that one goes this way, one goes that way. And hence there's zero coincidence. Of course, if you move away from that balanced position, you do start seeing some uh, coincidence. So that's called Hong or Mandel effect. And the, what it gives is that you have a, for both the photons going this way or that way. Now this effect, this fact can be used for this uh, uh, quantum lithography. This is still a, Kind of, this was 2000, but this is uh, still a theoretical idea as far as higher n is concerned. But uh, the the idea is there. So, what is what is uh, lithography? This is used in you know semiconductor industry for uh, writing patterns on, on on silicon chips. So, the classical lithography is works like this: either you have a, 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 a classical state of light or single photon coming in. It's a beam splitter. It goes. It either goes this way or goes this way, and then it kind of, uh, then you combine it at, at a substrate. And the, the, the electric field at the substrate will have either the IKX coming from this side or the minus IKX coming from this side. And the intensity pattern that you write on this uh, substrate is one plus cosine twice KX, uh, where K is the uh, wave vector. Um, okay, so, so in classical lithography, if, you, if, if this is a substrate, if you go in x direction, then the intensity that you can write is one plus cosine four pi x times la uh, by lambda, and I'm writing th this in terms of lambda. Okay, so now uh, if you have, so you, you can see if, if uh, uh, lambda, this wavelength decides uh, what pattern you can write. The smaller the, the wavelength, the finer the pattern you can write. But now let's say same wavelength, same rate photons, but you have two entangled photons. 
in 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 this Honga Mandel type setup, there are two entangled photons coming in very balanced position. So that means both the photons go this way, both the photons go that way. Now, if you use lithography with these entangled photons <coughs> in this Honga Mandel type setup, then the electric field here goes like to the i two kx to the minus i two kx, and then the pattern that you write is cosine eight pi x by lambda. So if you plot this pattern, the the substrate uh, it, it it looks like one plus cosine eight pi x by lambda. So the point is same wavelength. The wavelength has not changed, but now you can write twice as many patterns as you could do earlier. So wavelength is still the same, but now it's instead of just a, a classical light, I have entangled photons, and now I can uh, write uh, twice as many patterns on my chip. Um, and if you so this actually goes on. So instead of just two photons. If I have n photons, then I can write patterns which have n times the 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 fringe density of of having just the classical light. So this this idea this is called the quantum lithography. And if you have n entangled photons, then on the same chip you can write n as many patterns. Uh, so I n for just, lithography. Uh, uh, one statement I will make for the class. Yes. Uh, when we looked at quantum mechanical effects, we said that we can use those quantum mechanical effects for computation. And those examples we have seen in the class today, Anand also talked about it. But this is something where you see that those quantum effects can be used in a much diverse set of applications. And this is in some sense one application. There is no computation here, but for lithography also, you can use the quantum effects. And all these are pretty interesting. Yes. So, yes. Many, Thank many you. types. Yeah. Uh, so again, I'm not putting all. I'm just showing some that could be a little flashy <laughs> at, no, least yeah, at this exactly. point. Yes, yes. So the other one is quantum imaging. Uh, this is also a uh, you know, very uh, nice idea. Uh, uh, this is a very, very, very mind-boggling experiment that was done uh, when it was done in 1991. Uh, the idea here was that you have, uh, again, somebody was talking about the two crystals. So this is a two crystal geometry, but the two crystals are separate, not together. So this produces an entangled photon, that produces an entangled photon. Uh, and it turns out that by uh, disturbing a, or this photon or, or putting something in the path of this photon, you can change the fringe pattern that shows up here. So again, I don't want to go through the details of it uh, because that will be a little, uh, take a little longer. But it, this was in 1991, and, but in 2004, this, this came out in actually nature. They came up with an idea of doing imaging with undetected photons. So typically when we do imaging, it's the, we detect the light that has interacted with the object. I mean, uh, even in the environment, I mean, whatever sunlight falls on the tree, that tree gets into our eye, sorry, not tree, but the light falling on the tree gets into our eye and that's how we do the imaging. So imaging is always done with the photons or the light that has interacted with the object. But here they come up with an idea using, using, using this um, quantum effect that you can do imaging uh, with the photons that have not interacted with the uh, object. And they, they had the scat as an object and then they were able to show that yes, it can be done uh, you know, very effectively. Again, I, I have not gone through the, the, the details. Okay, quantum cryptography, this I won't, will do very quickly because I, I'm sure this has been covered in the class. Uh, we can have BBAT, for, yes, an ECAD protocol, ECAD unit entanglement, BBAT4 you don't. Uh, and then uh, it's perfectly secure because of the laws of uh, quantum mechanics. But the point I wanted to kind of uh, show that this quantum cryptography idea, uh, in 2000, 2000 people did it uh, in, in, in the lab, the first proof of principle. And this will actually be demonstrated for, I mean, this, this is a fairly complicated object, but it was uh, kind of demonstrated for this object. And as of 2007, <coughs> uh, they demonstrated over 144 kilometer, this, this idea of quantum, uh, uh, quantum cryptography. And as of 2017, uh, this is this has been demonstrated now from uh, set, uh, ground to ground state, station to satellite, this quantum key distribution. So the quantum cryptography has definitely come out uh, uh, like a long way. I mean, this is a, the, the picture that I'm showing is much simpler than the actual implementation uh, because it's a very, very different deal when you have set up experiment between uh, ground and satellite, at least with entangled photons. But yes, this has actually been demonstrated. This is as of 2017. So Anand, by the way, there yes. was some news that ISRO did it with like two recently, I don't know. Yes, yes, but that was not ground to satellite. That was no, no, no. Uh, one yeah, was some, some smaller distance. Yes, yeah. uh, but they also did QKD, right? Uh, QKD, yes, 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 QKD, yes. Uh, 
the uh, then finally this uh, quantum teleportation again uh, this might have been covered in the class this has uh, been uh, so again teleporting i like to show this yeah. teleportation uh, uh, it, it doesn't mean if if i want to you know teleport a state from this to this it doesn't mean sending the uh, particle but just sending the state that means if a, for a person if i can teleport the smile you know that would be the <laughs> that would be the example and then i just wanted to show this quantum teleportation this is as of 2012 Uh, this has been uh, demonstrated over 143 kilometer again i don't want to go into the details but it has been shown and this is again with the uh, parametric down conversion you see the same dbo crystal uh, parametric down conversion photons that it has been actually shown uh, so i think i have covered it uh, although i rushed to the last part but in the last one uh, my idea was basically to show the experiment that has been done with all the references uh, so yeah so i think i'm done great Uh, thanks thanks a lot anand this was this was very very uh, informative and entertaining i think so uh, yeah so uh, any any questions from the participants uh, you can obviously ask questions on the email later also you can ask now uh. so i wanted to ask one thing so uh, is is ear correct or not is what if you are the <laughs> thing that you mentioned uh, at the beginning uh no, so epr epr were definitely correct in terms of questioning whether this is how reality should look like now if you are getting into the uh, you know the the philosophical aspects of it but epr were the epr suggestions were actually wrong epr suggested that perhaps there can be a theory uh, which will have hidden variables and that might be able to explain uh the the effect that we see in the lab without using quantum mechanics and that suggestion has definitely been proven wrong but i personally people will disagree with me with their two different uh, you know ways of thinking about it but epr's question uh, are still relevant in when, when they question the definition of reality so so far the definition of reality is only in terms of numbers uh, in, in terms of real numbers so uh, whenever we say you know position momentum we always mean some real number 5 meters you know 5 meters per second or something but in quantum mechanics the problem is that uh, real numbers are not the main thing you can't do quantum mechanics without complex numbers uh and can you say complex numbers are real well no <laughs> complex numbers have a real part and an imaginary part imaginary part was supposed to be like a mathematical assistance when you do the math but it turns out the quantum mechanics uh, complex numbers are not optional i mean you you just cannot have quantum mechanics with real numbers so what epr were suggesting that perhaps we can have quantum mechanics just with, or or an alternative theory just in terms of real number but that suggestion is definitely incorrect that is not wrong uh, correct but people are still thinking that now when you define reality when we say real reality physical reality should be not still mean that something that is in terms of real numbers or can we take complex numbers as a reality so that i think has still not been settled but that's where it is so the, uh, the thing that is stopping it is just this mathematical uh, yeah, right this mathematical problems that we can we cannot explain so what no, no, is so, so, okay. Uh, like like sir said that uh, uh, this complex numbers is coming up again and again in, in quantum mechanics and what epr tried to explain was uh, just um, get, get rid of some complex numbers take real numbers yes so the, not that just was, that right uh, like that was epr's suggestion that perhaps there can be a theory but that suggestion has been proven wrong yes no. but in the paper they did not construct a theory based on real numbers but uh, they suggested that maybe one can have a theory uh, so both we, so, so both epr and uh, what we saw up till now quantum mechanics and epr both are correct but there has to be some theory sitting above them, this both of these two theories that is what you want to say no no no, no. Uh, it, it has been again ever showing the bell inequality violation so only alternative theory right now was what's called the hidden variable theories and that hidden variable theory has been proving in incorrect yes so quantum mechanics right now is the boss only debate is that what is defined as real or physical reality within quantum mechanics 
is that the is that the definition one should accept for physical reality or there should be some other definition that is a debate but whether quantum mechanics is right or wrong correct that there is no debate almost no debate now okay. yeah the, the the way epr wanted to explain the results of the experiments that way does not work that way of yes. hidden variable does not work. the only theory which can explain the experiments at this point is quantum Sir, can you sh share this slide with us? Yeah, this question was asked by other people. Yeah, also. yeah, I, yeah, I have no issue. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. So yeah, I'll, 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 I'll send it to Rajat, and then you can distribute. I will put it on the home page if you don't mind. No, no, I don't mind. <laughs> we, we, link, link we want the outreach video. anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so YouTube video also, if you can uh, put the fine, link fine. Like the presentation, that would be fine. Fine. In fact, I did the uh, no. I, I'll send you the link as well. Yes, yes. Uh, sir. Uh, yes. One thing, uh, like in many experiments, like uh, this one, quantum teleportation. Uh, after the experiment, say, you, uh, specify what kind of uh, what what distance uh, that uh, qubit was transferred over. Like in this case, it is one forty three kilometers. Uh, but uh, ideally, uh, it is that uh, the distance can be distance uh, distance can be uh, ideally infinite, right? But it can take any value. Mm -hmm. Or yes. uh, is there any attenuation uh, to the teleportation to the accuracy uh, oh, uh, as the distance is increased? Yes, I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, that's where the experiment, the difference between the theory and experiment. So when EPR did uh, in 1935, th their paper was that they were considering one particle to be on Earth, other one to be in some other galaxy. So from theoretical perspective, there is no issue. But yes, when you start doing experimentally, uh, the distance is definitely a big deal. And there are several issues that actually shows up. Uh, uh, one is the attenuation of the field itself. There are several issues. So I mean, you know, uh, when people showed this in 2007, 143 kilometers was a big deal. Then again, this is 2017, even longer distance, again, very big deal. Not just distance. When you have such a thing, you have you have a you know atmosphere. There's atmospheric turbulence that that kind of uh, uh, destroys the state or at least you know uh, mixes it up. So there are several issues that shows up uh, with with the distance. So if you can do for a few thousand kilometers, I think people are done. <laughs> Nobody would want to do uh, for 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 more than that. Uh, so, but those are like technological challenges. But yes, the moment you increase the distance, it, it, there are you know that's a very different problem, and that goes to the technology. There's a very different uh, kind of problem. It's not just a quantum, but the different kind of problem that actually shows up. Uh, but sir, we are only transferring a classical bit, right? So, uh, what kind of attenuation can it face? Uh, what, what do you mean, classical bit? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, right, uh, like in uh, quantum teleportation, we only need a classical channel. Uh, and uh, the quantum bit is transfer, uh, the qubit is transferred mm -hmm. uh, by uh, by the transfer of uh, some classical uh, classical information only, right? But, no, but the photon has to travel. Uh, there should be entanglement also, right? Okay, uh, so uh, that uh, the entangled bit has to be transferred over that distance. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So okay. channel is classical. Yeah, I mean it's a fiber or just air. But the the individual photons or the entangled photons, they have to cross that distance. And you know, I mean, in, in some implementation, they will keep Alice on Earth or in the lab. But at least Bob has to go somewhere to travel 143 kilometers somewhere. Okay. Uh, so the challenge is basically to uh, maintain that entanglement between those photons uh, while transferring uh, them yes, from one place yes, to another. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. So, I mean, because if you have a photon, it kind of, uh, you know, spreads over and diffracts. Those, those are the issue. If it sees turbulence, then the state itself changes. You can have a pure, pure state becoming a mixed state, you know. So there are several challenges. But yes, uh, if, if you can, if the challenge is essentially to maintain the state, if it's a one photon state or entangled photon state, in that case, the entangled state, that needs to be maintained over that 143 kilometer or whatever distance one is uh, doing that experiment over. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions? Uh, yes. Uh, so, like uh, entanglement theoretically works at every distance. So, uh, I mean, will it even work if somehow one of uh, the qubit got transferred in, inside the horizon of a black hole and the other one is outside the black hole? Right. So I am not the expert there, but yeah, there's something called, I mean, if, if you're talking that language, then you're probably aware of this called fire 
wall paradox so that is the idea that maybe you know the the light that is there in the universe some some of the light can be of those entangled pairs uh, one of which is on the other side in in the black hole on on the other side of the event horizon and one is is on this side and then they are trying to see what one can learn you know uh, uh, about the other side by just doing measurements on the first one so yeah so there are such scenarios but again i'm not uh, you know a real expert there yes Sir, what was the name of that thing that you just said? Some paradox. Firewall paradox. That's what it's called, I guess, if I remember it correctly. It's just like EPR paradox, but there's there's no paradox in EPR. It's just the uh, it was just the argument, uh, you know, that was conflicting with the very first principle of quantum mechanics, and so that paradox is is also in the same sense, as far as I understand. Again, I have not. Uh, I shouldn't be saying yeah, but I just know this is just the information that I know. I haven't studied that paradox in detail. I guess if there are no more questions, uh, I would really, really like to thank Anand. Thank you, Anand. I will talk. Thank you. I was joking when I said trouble him, but we actually troubled you a lot. Uh, this was yeah. very, very informative. Uh, Excellent. Thank you. thank you very much. Uh, okay. Uh, I will put the slides and any other material. you want uh, okay okay thank you okay. Uh, all right thank you bye bye yeah bye so i will end the meeting and then we will i will see you guys tomorrow for the case thank you anand